Hey y'all, Coach NFI here, and in today's class, we're going to be talking about the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of Pentecost, as it's commonly called. We're going to talk about why there is a such Feast of Weeks, where it came from, and what it signifies, and then we're going to get into when it actually is. Now, these little known facts about the Feast of Weeks will be coming from the Book of Jubilees, primarily Chapter 6, as we talk about where the Feast comes from and where it was started. But then we'll touch on other chapters as we review verses that tells us exactly when it's supposed to be. So let's go on. Now, again, we're in the book of Jubilees, chapter six, and we're going to come all the way down to verse six, which says, And behold, I have given unto you all beasts and all winged things and everything that moves on the earth and the fish in the waters and all things for food as the green herbs. I have given you all things to eat. Now, this is important, guys, especially today. There's a lot of discussion over whether we're supposed to eat meat or whether we're supposed to eat this or eat that. Understand from this verse here, and it says the same thing in the book of Genesis, that all living things are for food. All living things can be eaten. Now, sure, Moses got dietary laws and all things should not be eaten, but those dietary laws are not part of any covenant. Those biblical precepts are mainly living parables for us to understand the different kinds of men that walk amongst us. Yeah, I said it. Some of us act like pigs and should not be associated with or eaten, as the Bible says. But most of those rules are simply for our health. Like, for instance, how tuna doesn't have scales. Therefore, parasites can get under the skin and when you eat tuna, which may not always be cooked properly in these end times, but end up making you sick. Well, I understand it is still food. So let's go on. Verse seven says, but flesh with the life thereof, with the blood, ye shall not eat for the life of all flesh is in the blood, lest your blood of your lives be required at the hand of every man at the hand of every beast will I require the blood of man. So here is the difference, guys. And I believe this is why a lot of people don't want to eat meat. We have been trained through the culture that we live in that rare meat is preferred. People even pick on you when you cook the meat fully or well done. They say that we are destroying the meat. Well, actually what we're doing when we raise the temperature of that meat up to about 165 degrees, we are denaturing the meat, forcing all of the blood and the water out. So when a person tells you to eat rare meat, they're actually telling you to eat blood. And this is why there will be such hardship here in these end times, because you see what it says right there? At the hand of every man, at the hand of every beast, will I require the blood of man. So those of us who are still eating blood with the meat nowadays will be in trouble. And guys, I must say, there's a lot of different ways that you can get the blood out of the meat. If you follow that channel, you see we've done a lot of experiments from boiling it to seething it in water at 165 degrees to even salting it, putting about 6% salt on it for so many days will draw out all of the blood. And I'm sure there's other ways, but I think the main way that our father wanted us to understand how to eat meat properly was given to us in the example of Passover, where we roast the lamb or the goat over the open fire until it falls off the bone. That's how we know it's done when the meat separates from the bone. And at that point, we can be sure that the temperature has gotten high enough to force some of the oil out of the meat and all of the blood. In other words, to me, it seems that Passover was your education on how to cook meat properly. But anyway, let's go on. Verse eight says, whoso sheddeth men's blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God made he man. So this is kind of strange from one minute. We're talking about eating rare steak to next. We're talking about meriting people, but Notice the relationship. Blood is blood. Whether it come from an animal or man. So those who prefer their rare meat will be counted with those who prefer killing people. Hmm. We better think hard on that. 
We're given one day to figure all of this stuff out. And then comes the judgment. Let's go on. Verse 9 says, And you increase ye and multiply on the earth. Now, if we come back to the earlier parts of the chapter, we can get some idea of what this is all about. This is during the time when Noah first got off of the ark. Notice that it's in the third month. Yeah, all of these events went down on Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. But look at verse 10. It says, And Noah and his sons swore that they would not eat any blood that was in any flesh. And he made a covenant before the Lord God forever throughout all the generations of the earth in this month. So this is how we know the Pentecost is the covenant feast. This feast is all about the covenant. We've done in many classes before and showed how Abraham got his covenant during the Feast of Weeks. We see here that Noah got the Noadic covenant during the Feast of Weeks. We're going to see that Jacob had visitations with our father during the Feast of Weeks. And we know that the disciples received the Holy Spirit during the Feast of Weeks. And we too are expecting the new covenant to come down during the Feast of Weeks. That's what the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost is really all about. We're going to read here that it is a twofold celebration with the first one mentioned being the covenant. You see that this covenant was given to all of the generations, even the Gentiles. That's why you see Paul mention it to them, even though he left out most of the other rules of the covenant. He did tell them not to eat blood. It's because of this covenant, which was made for all generations. And then notice that he says he made it in this month during the time of Pentecost. So what is the purpose of the Feast of Weeks? It is to remind us of the covenant that Noah made that we would not eat blood. So let's go on. Verse 11 says, On this account he spake to thee that thou shouldest make a covenant with the children of Israel in this month upon the mountain with an oath, and that thou shouldest sprinkle blood upon them because of all of the words of the covenant which the Lord made with them forever. So now, here you are having a little bit of separation because it is only Israel who is keeping this feast. Now, like we said, we're going to get into the timing of when the feast is because when you look at your calendar, you're going to find that even though it says Pentecost on there, it's actually related to the holiday Easter and falls on the calendar 50 days after Easter Sunday. That's why if you look at last year's calendar, it's going to fall on a Sunday. And if you look at next year's calendar, you'll find that Pentecost falls on a Sunday. It's because it's not related to this blood covenant at all. This celebration is of twofold. One is for the covenant, but we're going to find out why the other one is here in a minute. And that's going to explain why the Catholics pay attention to Pentecost at all. So let's go on. Verse 12 says, and this testimony is written concerning you that you should observe it continually so that you should not eat any blood of beast or birds or cattle during all the days of the earth. And the man who eats the blood of beast or cattle or of birds during all the days of the earth, he and his seed shall be rooted out of the land. Guys, so when you're wondering why is so many people about to perish during this time? It's because we're eating blood. Now, I have to remind you that the repentant heart always has to be accepted. So, don't worry about what we've eaten in the past. But, whether you repent it or not, you're going to have to stop eating blood one way or the other. Or, like we read above, these wild animals are going to come out of the woods to eat us. But now, when you're looking here closely at verse 12, notice what's missing. We don't see the word fish there, which could explain why the Messiah ate so much fish. If you've ever cleaned the fish, you know that their blood is different. Once you get them cleaned and put on ice, you'll notice that the water doesn't turn red like it does after you've slaughtered a cow or a lamb. Now, verse 13 says, and do thou command the children of Israel to eat no blood, so that their names and their seed may be before the Lord our God continually. So guys, do you see what Pentecost is all about? This Feast of Weeks is all about eating blood 
or not eating it. This is the blood festival. This festival is to remind us not to do so every year. And if we're explaining this to our kids, we won't have a problem with this going forward. They, like the people of old, would always know to get the blood out of the meat. This is why they had seething pots back then. Anyway, we'll hear more about that too. So let's go on. Verse 14 says, And for this law there is no limit of days, for it is forever. They shall observe it throughout their generations, so that they may continue supplicating on your behalf with blood before the altar. Every day and at the time of morning and evening they shall seek forgiveness on your behalf perpetually before the Lord that they may keep it and not be rooted out. The first thing that comes to mind in this verse is, who is this they? It is necessary that our priests and our Levites who plan to make these offerings for our forgiveness every day have to be sure to abstain from eating blood else their offerings will not be accepted and we will all be rooted out for our sin. But notice up there it says there is no limit of days to this covenant. That's the thing about covenants guys. They last forever. The contracts are never to be broken. All of the covenants are still in effect today. This one, the Noadic covenant and notice I didn't say Noahide covenant. That's not the same as the Noadic covenant. This is the Noadic Covenant. It involves not eating blood and a rainbow, we're going to find out. But the Abrahamic Covenant is still in effect. The Davidic Covenant is still in effect. The Mosaic Covenant is still in effect. Covenants are contracts that are never to be broken. We are to observe these throughout our generations. Now, there's a lot to unpack on this verse. I mean, you can read this to say that those who will not abstain from eating blood will not have the ability to make offerings on our behalf, no matter what race or creed they are. But anyway, let's discuss that in the comment section. Let's go on. Verse 15 says, And he gave to Noah and his sons a sign that there should not again be a flood on the earth. See, when you remember what the flood was about, why was there a flood in the first place? It's because humans had transgressed to the point where they were not only eating blood, but they were eating the blood of other humans. See, when the fallen angels came and made it with these women, their offspring became giants, what we know as Nephilim. And after this video, you can jump on to Google and do a search for prehistoric giants found and you can see that some of these people were 35 feet tall. Now, the way the story goes is that they made themselves rulers and forced the normal sized humans to bring them food. But when the famines came and the food ran out, these giants started eating the people. And it was the cry of the blood of these people that was eating that rose up to our father, prompting him to raise his hand of protection off of us and of course, this was quickly followed by the elements rising up to destroy man off the face of the earth. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? This is exactly what's going on now, guys. This is why it's important that you understand and adhere to this covenant. Verse 16 says, He set a bow in the cloud for a sign of the eternal covenant that there should not again be a flood on the earth to destroy it in all the days of the earth. So you think about what this rainbow really means. Sure, it comes with the promise that he will never use water to destroy the earth again. But really, it is to remind us that we're not supposed to be eating blood. Otherwise, we will be destroyed by something else. Fire, wind or earth. Verse 17 says, for this reason, it is ordained and written on the heavenly tablets that they should celebrate the Feast of Weeks in this month, once a year, to renew the covenant every year. What we're doing on the Feast of Pentecost is renewing the covenant that we too will never eat blood. And if we have done so already, 
we will develop a repentant heart and learn not to eat blood ever again, even if that means changing our diets completely. And I believe that's what some people have done. While their flesh was desiring that flavor that we get from rare meat, our spirits are in rejection and we appease that spirit by not eating any meat at all. Better safe than sorry. Verse 18 says, And this whole festival was celebrated in heaven from the day of creation till the days of Noah, 26 jubilees and five weeks of years. And Noah and his sons observed it for seven jubilees and one week of years till the day of Noah's death. And from the day of Noah's death, his sons did away with it until the days of Abraham and they eat blood. So all of the world broke this covenant immediately after Noah died. So this would explain why we don't hear from anybody until we get to Abraham. Everybody from Noah to Abraham were covenant breakers, according to what we read here. And I'm sure by now you understand, if you break the covenant with our father, you also break the communication link with him. That's what the covenant is for, to help us to understand how it is we are to stop acting like animals so we can be recognized as spirit beings. Now, in the previous verse, we learned that this festival is written on the holy tablets. And then in this verse, we see that it was celebrated in heaven until the days of Noah. So Noah was the first to hear about it. This is the first time humans were made aware of this covenant. So Pentecost is the Noahic covenant. Those that are not keeping the fist of Pentecost can and will be subject to the elements that creates the next extinction level event. Now, verse 19 says, but Abraham observed it and Isaac and Jacob and his children observed it up to thy days. And in thy days, the children of Israel forgot it until ye celebrated it anew on this mountain. And we'll get into this a little bit when we talk about the timing of all of this. We're going to see why it is that Abraham kept the Feast of Weeks. This was part of that communication that he received with those two angels that was headed into Sodom and Gomorrah. We'll cover that in another video. Now that I think about it, that's serious. That Abraham was reminded of Pentecost before the fire and brimstone came down. Hmm. I'll do a little bit more research on that. Y'all make sure y'all have the bell notification button pushed so y'all can see that video when it comes out, Lord willing. Let's look at verse 20. It says, And do thou command the children of Israel to observe this festival in all their generations for a commandment unto them. One day in the year, in this month, they shall celebrate the festival. So we see here again, he's trying to get into the timing of all of this. And we will. But notice how it's saying the children of Israel. This book was written by Moses. So as he was commanding the children of Israel of the covenant, he would have also been talking to them about the Noahic covenant, which we're reading here. This is what caused Moses and the children of Israel to remember the Noahic covenant in the first place. Moses was learning this as this book was being dictated to him. So this makes it extremely important to Israel. This is what it means to be Israel. Guys, don't be confused. Israel is a spiritual name. That's how you know it has that E-L at the end. This is talking about spirit beings, not genetics or heritage or bloodlines or where you live. In other words, if you don't keep the Feast of Pentecost, you're not Israel. But let's go on. Verse 21 says, For it is the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of first fruits. This feast is twofold and of a double nature according to what is written and engraven concerning it. Celebrate it. We're supposed to celebrate the Feast of Weeks, but like we said, is of a twofold nature. There's one aspect that deals with the covenant, and that's all we've been hearing about here, is the covenant aspect of the feast. That is an extremely important part of the Feast of Pentecost, but that's only one side of it. That's what he means when he says of a double nature. Then you look at verse 22, it says, For I have written in the book of the first law, 
that which I have written for thee, that thou shouldest celebrate it in its season, one day in the year. And I explain to thee its sacrifices, that the children of Israel should remember and should celebrate it throughout their generations in this month, one day in every year. So there is the other half of the festival. It is a day of sacrifice. And you guys check the video links at the end where we'll get into more of what it is that we're supposed to be doing on this day. But it also involves sacrifices. That's the time when we're supposed to pay our tithes. You know, offerings is something we make throughout the year. But according to the way scripture works, it is one time in the year during the Feast of Pentecost that we are supposed to pay our tithes. But we cover that in other videos. So let's get into the timing of all of this. Notice how verse 22 says celebrated in its season one day in a year which means that there is an exact timing that we're supposed to be celebrating this festival, not any time we want. And then again, he says that Israel should remember and should celebrate it throughout their generations in this month, one day in a year. So let's see when this is. Now, one of the first places we'll look to talk about the timing of the Feast of First Fruits is over in chapter 15 where you see that in verse one, it says that Abram celebrated the Feast of first fruits in the middle of the month, not at the beginning of the month or on the sixth day of the month, but he celebrated in the middle of the month. And when we come to chapter 44, where we read about Jacob celebrating the Feast of first fruits, we see it getting down more specifically, not just saying the middle of the month, it's saying the 14th day of the third month. You see in verse one that it was on the seventh day of the third month that he made a sacrifice. This was the time that Joseph and Pharaoh was inviting him into Egypt and he wasn't sure if he was supposed to go. Then in verse three, you see that after he made the sacrifice, he remained another seven days, hoping to hear from our father to help him decide whether to go into Egypt or not. So seven plus seven is 14. And that's when he celebrated the harvest festival of first fruits with old grain. So, whereas we were just told that Abraham did it in the middle of the month, which could imply the 15th, we see specifically that Jacob did it on the 14th. And if you're trying to make this line up with your scripture, you have to understand it is the second part. It is the offerings that got the Catholic Church interested in this festival. Like we mentioned before, this is the time that we're supposed to be paying tithes. So you see why it is that they put it on their calendar 50 days after Easter. That's the time in which they're hoping you would bring your tithes money down to their church. That's how they built the Vatican. But anyway, when you look at Leviticus chapter 23 from the Septuagint, the days actually line up because whereas the King James Version says seven Sabbaths, shall be complete. The Septuagint, which is a older, more reliable translation, even the one that John, Paul, and even our Messiah quoted from, it doesn't say seven Sabbaths, it says seven full weeks, starting the day after the first Sabbath day that ends the week of unleavened bread. That's how you get to the 14th day of the third month. So, the Feast of Pentecost is on the 14th. That's the day of sacrifice. That's the day when a lot of people will be slaughtering animals. One of these noisy lambs you hear in the background might be called to service that day, if you know what I mean. But it's on the 15th day, the Sabbath day, that I will enjoy the meat resulting from that sacrifice that was made on the 14th day. And then, having done that sacrifice, and spent that day with the Lord, we could be expecting a visitation of some sort on the 16th day of the third month. So check out those other videos, giving more details on what it is that we're supposed to be doing and make sure you hit that like button and see you in the comment section.